the Great Commission. That's what the church is all about, Charlie Brown. That's what we're going to be talking about today from Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts chapter 1. Welcome to People of the Free Gift, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us for one of our verse-by-verse Bible studies. We are almost completely through the four Gospels. And uh, once we are through with this series, I'm going to go back and put back all of those uh, sermons that we took off previously uh, because we were silly, quite honestly. And uh, we're going to be having those released daily uh, so that you can kind of go back if you're new here. And uh, if you are new here, go ahead and click that subscribe button and enable notifications. And so you don't miss anything that we release. And we release verse by verse teachings of the Bible at least once a week. And like I said, there's going to be more coming very soon. And then we're going to do daily uh, journey through the Bible starting in Genesis. That's going to be starting real soon. So you want to subscribe to this channel. Uh, you are in the right place. And so let's go ahead and jump into our topic for the day. And that is, like I said, the Great Commission. So Matthew 28, 16, then the 11 disciples went away from Galilee, went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And the first thing I want to say, just to kind of set this up, is that my previous conception, and this has happened a lot as we've been going through the Gospels, my previous conception of what happened and transpired in the Great Commission had changed, has changed. I, I used to think of it as like this was a singular event in which uh, at the end, right before Jesus descends into heaven, he releases his uh, apostles to go into all the world and to make disciples. And what I'm finding is that if I compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts and their various accounts of the Great Commission or their various um, tellings of it, what you find is that Jesus is in very different places with different groups of people and he is emphasizing different things. And so like a lot of things in his ministry, uh, like him prophesying his death and resurrection, he, he said it uh, several times. Uh, in talking about the kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, he talked about it several times times and in sense of uh, what it means to follow him. And so his parables, his miracles, and a lot of repeat throughout the ministry of Jesus and the Great Commission isn't really any different. And so this is going to be kind of a thematic sermon because it's taking all of those accounts and putting them into one place. And what what is the Great Commission? And what did Jesus say about it? How are we supposed to carry it out? All of those types of things. And so it's going to be a little bit different than what we've been doing uh, because we already tackled John's version uh, when we were in John chapter 20. And we're going to be dealing with the others here. But as he gets started out here, this is, you know, after the resurrection, you have the instructions. Tell him to go into Galilee. Meet me in Galilee. I'll be in Galilee. Okay, and one of the things that I see as a difference between these accounts is that this happens very clearly in Matthew's uh, version in Galilee, and then you have the others where he's appearing to the disciples and they're in Jerusalem. And in fact, in Acts chapter 1, it is right before the ascension, and in Luke's version, it's also right before the ascension. Uh, that shouldn't surprise us. It's kind of like Acts picks up right where Luke, there's some slight overlap um, between the ending of Luke and the beginning of Acts. And then John 20, he's in that you know upper room, and it's right after he uh, proves himself to Thomas and the other guys, and um, my Lord and my God, and he's then issues into you know, receive the Holy Spirit. And as I have been sent, then I send you, okay? And so there's different things that are being emphasized in each of these four Gospels, and that shouldn't surprise us because that is how it's been going down all along. But the first thing that we encounter is that it says they finally go to Galilee, and Jesus, uh, uh, and Jesus appears to them, and he has instructions for them, but it says, as he appears to them, they all worship him, but some doubted. And this is actually one of the few times I, if that I can think of where 
they see Jesus and they know who he is right off the bat. And so Jesus isn't, you know, trying to hide himself from them. He told them to go to Galilee. They finally do. I think there was a lot of hesitation, and that's part of the reason why you have the other resurrection appearances and the other Gospels uh, is because they didn't listen to the women, you know, and Jesus reprimands them for that in one of the appearances. And so they're sticking around in Jerusalem. And as you get into the book of Acts, you're going to find that's going to be a problem Again, they tend to stick around in Jerusalem and don't want to get out of their comfort zone. And so Jesus, I think one of the reasons he's telling them, go to Galilee, is I want you to go back home, boys. I want you to go where this began. I want you to go where your family and your friends are after the three years, and they're going to ask you. Obviously, you've been gone a long time. You're following Jesus. What happened? We've heard, you know, he was crucified. Hey, he rose again from the dead right into the gospel, right? So I think that's part of why he sent him to Galilee. And then, of course, they end up back in Jerusalem for the ultimate, you know, final commissioning for before he goes into heaven. And we're going to get into the ascension uh, probably next week. And so uh, then, so what we see here is that it says they worshiped him, but some doubted. They worshipped him, but some doubted. So you still have this slight hesitation on the part of some. It doesn't mean that they didn't believe. All of these guys at this point, they all believe. They're all his apostles. Judas is out. He's gone. It's over with. And you have the 11 faithful. They're, they're there. And so Peter's issue has been resolved. And, you know, Thomas is there. They're all there. They all believe. But some of them, they doubt. And what are they doubting? Some of them are worshiping him. And just in case you wondered, this word is proskuneo. It's the word for worship, and they're worshiping Jesus. And maybe you've not really understood that that's okay, uh, that it is perfectly acceptable to worship Jesus. It's perfectly acceptable to pray to Jesus. In fact, if any of you have ever heard me pray, uh, you'll hear me say, Lord Jesus, at the beginning of my prayers. It's just how I feel led to pray. Um, and I feel like I'm connecting personally with him. I, I, and that's just the way it is. And so, you know, Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and 7, or, uh, you see him praying directly to Jesus. And there's some other instances. And here you see them worshiping Jesus, which tells you that he was willing to receive worship, which means he's not an angel. It means that he's not a human uh, or purely human. He is God in human flesh. He's co-equal, co-eternal with God. He shares all of the attributes of God. And we're going to get to that in a second. I'll never forget, um, I had a friend who was LDS, big surprise, and uh, we made a deal with each other. I was going to read Doctrine and Covenants. She was going to read the New Testament. And then I was going to go to her church. She was going to go to my church. And we were going to just discuss what we were reading, uh, what we had questions about, what we were experiencing. Um, and so when, we, when it was my turn to take her to church, we actually ended up not going to my church. We ended up going to a Calvary Chapel, like a young adult meeting. And so it was typical, though, church. It was a worship and then a message. And afterwards, we went out to eat, and I just said, hey, what would you think? And she said, you know... It was weird. It was almost like it was almost like they were worshiping Jesus. And I said, exactly. You just pinpointed the major difference between us and you. Is that we believe that Jesus is the very God that we worship and that that is the reason why he died on the cross as a payment for our sins and rose again from the dead. And it kind of launched into this conversation because she was able to see the, the difference between the way that LDS worship and the way that Christians worship. And so uh, it is okay to worship Jesus. Matthew 28, 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I had another conversation with a guy um, in which he tried to use this verse to prove that Jesus wasn't God because he says, see, Jesus said that all authority had to be given to him. And so if it had to be given to him, then he didn't have it in the first place. And so he couldn't be God. 
And I just and I would encourage you if you get into these conversations, don't just state why they're wrong. Ask them clarifying follow-up questions. And so here's what I asked them. I said, "Are you prepared to say that before this moment, this transfer in which you believe that this authority was given to Jesus, do you, are you prepared to say that Jesus had no authority before that?" And no, of course not, because, you know, we were able to kind of walk through how Jesus showed his authority in the miracles that he performed, in the teaching, and his authority over demons and being able to cast out demons. And so, of course, he had authority before. And so, uh, what in what sense could he say that he didn't have authority if we clearly saw that he had authority. And then the second question I asked him is, are you prepared to say that after this exchange, that you think this is what this is saying, that the Father had no authority, zero authority? Because Jesus said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if you're going to say that Jesus had no authority and then all of this authority had to be given to him, then you're saying that Jesus had no authority beforehand, and you're saying the Father, after the exchange, has no authority after that. And of course, this guy was not prepared to say either of those things, and he was able to see that that's a faulty line of reasoning, that this verse cannot be used to prove that Jesus is not God. In fact, I would say the opposite. I would say that this verse conclusively proves that Jesus is God because God does not share his glory with another. And it says all judgment has been committed unto the Father, but Jesus can turn around and say that I am, you know, going to judge the living and the dead. And all authority has been given to me, okay? And so if Jesus is not God, this would be blasphemous for him to say. And following right after the fact that they worshipped him, uh, this passage is completely and expressly saying that Jesus is God. He should be worshipped. It's okay to worship him. And all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. Now, notice what he does with that in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 in Luke 24. It says, And behold... I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then in Mark 16, 17, it says, In these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And uh, we're going to get to that when, in a second. Let's just take the first one. Okay, Jesus in, the, in Luke 24 in Acts chapter 1, he's basically saying the same thing. He called on them to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit was going to come. And uh, that was at the point of 40 days after he rose from the dead. And so they waited in Jerusalem 10 days until the day of, Pente day of Pentecost. And that's when the Holy Spirit came. And there's a number of reasons for that, the reason why it was delayed. And one, it was brand new. Okay, this was the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, okay? Um, other than the difference for the transition from the law to grace, you know, and I believe it was all really under grace, but the law was just foreshadowing and predicting and pointing forward to the Messiah and able to teach us that we are not able to save ourselves. But in the New Covenant, in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit was always there. He's been there since creation, Genesis 1. But it, he would come upon individuals. He would empower individuals for a particular time and task, like the prophets, priests, kings, and certain individuals who were called to do a certain task. Then once that task was over, then the Holy Spirit would leave. Okay? And the new in the New Covenant, it says that the Holy Spirit will make his home in you. He will be in you. He will inhabit you in the same way that it was said in the Old Testament that he inhabited the temple. It, Paul says, you, you individually and you collectively, the church, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you were not your own. You were bought with a price, okay? And so it's the abiding, dwelling uh, spirit of God within the life of the believer 
that was different, okay? And so that is what came on the day of Pentecost. Now, why Pentecost? And that was because the day of Pentecost was all about pointing forward to that very thing. It was the only feast in which you would have a mixture of leavened and unleavened bread, okay? Jews and Gentiles. And so you have the day of Pentecost, the, the, the you know, Shavuot, um, the, the day of harvest, you know, um, you have that foreshadowing the day in which the Holy Spirit was going to come and give birth to this thing that we call the church. That was officially when the church was born, the new covenant was launched, um, is when the Holy Spirit was able to dwell within believers. Now, the question is, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and when do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And Mark 16 is one of those chapters we talked about a, a few weeks ago. We talked about whether or not these verses are, were in the original manuscripts, and I tend to believe that they were. There's a lot of good scholars that don't believe that, and I understand that, and we can fight over it in the comments down below. But um, one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want uh, the ending of Mark 16 to be in the originals is because of verses like this. They don't know what to do with this. And we're going to see one other verse before we're done here today that they don't know what to do with. And so when he says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up servants. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. What is he talking about? Well, some have said that this is kind of like an outline of the book of Acts and what exactly happens. Now, is Jesus saying categorically that every in every instance, every single time somebody believes these types of things are going to happen? Did he say that every believer is going to handle serpents and not be killed or drink poison or those kind of things? Well, there's obviously some groups in the deep south that believe those kind of things, okay? And they are really wicked, creepy, okay? So <laughs> um, just saying, uh, so is Jesus saying that? No, he's not speaking universally. And how do we know that? Because we have to interpret scripture in light of scripture in terms in light of the whole counsel of God. All you have to do is turn to the book of Acts and read about when people uh, received the Holy Spirit, when they were converted, did they do these things? And in some cases, yes. And in some cases, no. Okay. So he's describing things that the types of things that will happen. But he, this isn't the only thing. In Acts chapter 1, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In Galatians 5, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. In Romans 12, he describes the gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, the manifestations of the Spirit. Okay, so you have different things. And then in John, you know, 13 through 17, in the upper room discourse, Jesus talked about the conviction and the guiding into all truth. And in Romans 8, that we talked, to, he talks about the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so, and he says, if, if anybody does not have the Spirit of God, he is not his. And so that verse right there tells you that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you are not a believer in Jesus Christ. You are not his child. So that if you flip that around, then in order for us to be called the children of God, according to John 1.12, then we have to have the Holy Spirit. Beyond that, in Ephesians 1.3, uh, Paul says we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And in 2 Peter 1, he says that we've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. In 2 Timothy 3, he says that all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if, if there's anything that after you believe, if there's anything left that's like a separate ritual or ordinance or thing that you have to do to get something that God uh, wants to give you, then that contradicts every single one of those passages. OK, 
Okay, so some would say in the book of Acts, why is the baptism of the Holy Spirit often accompanied by, you know, tongues and, you know, miracles and all sorts of stuff, okay? Um, what's going on there is that there was a transition time that God had to get them used to the fact that cha things are different. So these are Jewish believers who were, you know, the apostles of a church of primarily Jewish people in Jerusalem, and they had a hard time transitioning from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, you know. They had a tra hard time transitioning from having to be circumcised and keep the Sabbath and keep the law um, to, in order to be Jewish and have an identity and a relationship with God to... Um, that being received by faith and the Holy Spirit coming in and writing his law in their hearts, and then they are given a new life, and they're a new creation. And so it took things like the sheet being pulled down in front of Peter's face and saying, kill and eat. It took them being sent to Cornelius' house and seeing a whole slew of Gentiles come to faith in once, and they start speaking in tongues while he's still speaking because they receive the Holy Spirit. And his wording is, you know, like, I hope that we can receive the Holy Spirit like they do, right? Um, because he finally got it. And then, then you have that settled at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. And so you have these cases where they're going into these new territories, which I believe is what the meaning of like Acts 1-8, which we're going to get to in a second, has to do with. So how do you know if you're baptized with the Holy Spirit? I would say this. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again from the dead? And do you intend to follow him all the days of your life? Those are the two questions I asked before. Someone gets baptized in water, and if you can't, if you can't get baptized in water, you are not. Uh, I'm not saying if you haven't been baptized in water, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying if you have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you should, you have no business being baptized in water. Does that make sense? Okay, let's move on. All right, Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he that believes in is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Okay, and that's the other troubling verse from Mark 16, and we're going to deal with that. So by what authority do you do these things? Jesus, actually, he issues three different commands in the Great Commission. One of them is not go. Uh, we always emphasize the go, go, go. You know what? The go in this is actually assumed. It's actually assumed that you are going somewhere. And aren't we? I mean, we go to work. We go to school. We go home. We go to church. We're going, going, going. Okay, the going is not an issue. It's what are you doing when you go? That's the issue. And so Jesus says like more like, as you go, then make disciples. That's the first command of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them uh, everything that I've commanded you. Okay, so those are the three commands. And notice what Jesus said before, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me so Go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them. Uh, make disciples, baptize, and teach them. You have authority in the name of Jesus to do all three of those things. Another thing that is, I, I ask when somebody wants to get baptized in water, they come to me, and after I've concluded, yep, they know what they're doing. They're a believer in Jesus Christ. I don't make it complicated. I, I already told you the two questions I asked them, and if they can articulate that to me, then I believe that they, they know what they're doing and that they're a believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to question that, okay? So, uh, of course, <laughs> unless I'm talking to somebody that comes from a different type of faith, and then I'm going to ask clarifying questions. Sometimes they will. Um, anyway, just to make sure, but I'm just saying I don't make it complicated. But I ask them two questions. When do you want to do it, and who do you want to do it? 
And I try and get them baptized as soon as possible because I believe we create such a disconnect between the moment somebody believes and the moment in which they're baptized into which they think that those are two separate things. And in the New Testament, I really see them almost just like instantaneous with one another. As soon as the person was able to, then they got baptized in water. And so the, the who do you want to do this is the question that throws everybody off. You see, when I was starting out seminary, I filled out this application to do retro internship credit, okay? And, um, and because I had served in the church and done youth group and all that kind of stuff before, and so I was trying to get credit so that I can get out of seminary faster and get into ministry and get on with my life. Well, I put together this whole folder with all my experience and got recommendations from my supervisor and everybody else, and... The only response I got back, along with my rejection, was, why were you baptizing people if you were not ordained? And I could not believe it. I could not believe that that was the question that was being asked of me. Uh, because of this very verse, Jesus says to all of his believers, go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. Do it in my name, in my authority. I have spoken it. It is so just the way that I created the world, just the way that I calmed the sea, just the way that, you know, I raised the dead. I say the word and it comes to pass. And that's the authority by which we do these things. And uh, for anybody to call into question anybody, any believer in Christ, baptizing another Christian, another person who's professed faith in Jesus Christ is absolutely absurd and ridiculous, and I won't stand for it. Anyway, uh, by what authority do you do these things? By the spoken word of Jesus, the Lord and Savior, the one who has authority over all things in heaven and on earth. Next question, the difference between evangelism and discipleship. Jesus doesn't say, you know, we want to make this about evangelism, and it's not about evangelism, it's actually about discipleship. And someone would ask, what's the difference? There's two different words in the Greek, okay? The, what we call evangelism is a word that wasn't even translated. It's just literally like the equivalent of the Greek letters transferred into the equivalent of the English letters. And the word is euangeliso, okay? And that means to preach the good news, preach the gospel. That's literally what it means. There are several different words for preach. That is one of them. And it's specific to preaching that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again from the dead, just like it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Okay? So that word is not anywhere in this passage. Okay? Now, are we called to do that? And is it part of making disciples? Absolutely. But what's the difference? I believe the difference is what Jesus follows that up with. He says, make disciples of all nations. And you can just see that he's talking to the ones who are now called apostles because he's sending them out literally right now. But they were his dis disciples. A disciple, literally, the word means learner. Okay, But in that case, Jesus took them along under his wing and he guided them. He, he did experiences. He did life with them. He, he taught them. And that's what he's calling these guys to do. Make disciples of mine. But, I mean, in a way, you could say, like, like Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Okay? That we or kind of that, that guiding force along with the Holy Spirit and along with God, it doesn't mean we make huge life decisions for these people. It means that we try and teach them what we have learned since we've become a Christian. And we point them to resources that will help them along in their journey. And we introduce them to new people um, that they might have something in common with and who might be able to help them in other areas that we're not able to. Okay, that's where discipleship is. And these two words that Jesus follows it up with is baptize them and then teach them. Teach them what? Teach them to obey every, to obey, to keep my commandments, everything that I've taught you. And if I were to ask you, and we're going to, actually, we'll get to this later, okay? So what about this Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved? 
Is he saying that you have to be baptized in order to be saved? No. Read carefully. What is the emphasis in what he's talking about? He says it twice, but the second time, something's missing. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. So the difference between his damnation and salvation is belief that then expresses itself in baptism. You have to take scripture in light of the whole counsel of God. Okay, there's no other place that you can point to that would say that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. All one has to do is point to any one individual who was saved without being baptized, and the classic one is the thief on the cross, to prove the fact that you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. In fact, Paul is speaking to a whole bunch of believers in Corinth, and he's saying, I'm ashamed of the lot of you. I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you, for God did not call me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So if Paul was called to preach the gospel and not to baptize, they can't be connected. They can't be the same thing. You can't say, I preached the gospel, someone accepted the gospel, they weren't baptized, but then that means that they're not saved. Okay? There's no way you can possibly make that argument. So what is baptism? First of all, the word means immerse. Okay, uh, It's another one of those untranslated words where they just took the Greek equi equivalent to the English equivalent letter and they didn't translate the word. This is going to sound funny, but the best description of what the word means comes from an ancient recipe for making pickles. Okay, and uh, there's two different words in the Greek. One is bapto, one is baptizo, okay? Bapto, baptizo, okay? And bapto is like if you took a cucumber and you dipped it in the brine. You just dipped it. Now, it might have a little flavoring on it when you took a bite out of it, but the texture would be the same, the consistency would be the same, and the taste ultimately would be pretty much the same. It'd be a cucumber that has a little, a little drippings on it, right? But baptizo, if you baptize that cucumber, you immerse it, you leave it in the brine, and then what comes out when you're done with it? A pickle. Okay, it has changed. It has been completely immersed in that brine to the point in which its substance, its texture, its taste has changed. Okay, it's a completely different food. If you buy pickles or you buy a cucumber, completely different food in substance. And that's the point of baptism. It's not that baptism saves you, but it's a picture of of what has happened on the inside. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, he says, you have been buried with Christ through baptism, and then you have been risen again through newness of life. And so you have this picture. We have died with Christ, and now we have been risen again with Christ and seated in the heavenly places with Christ. That is our current status and identity. We are a new creature. And so baptism is a picture of what Jesus has done for us and what we have done in public identification with him. And so that's why we get baptized in water. And it is separate from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't believe, is a separate ritual that you have to go through in order to get more of what God wants for you. In fact, baptism doesn't give you more of what God wants for you. It's just doing it in obedience and doing it as a picture, like I said, of what God has done on the inside of you. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to pay attention and hold on to all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. So uh, a lot of groups out there, they want to make it into like when Jesus says, keep my commandments, obey everything that I have commanded you. And if you love me, then you're going to do this. Uh, they make it into like if you're not keeping the commands of Jesus, then that means that you can't be his disciple, you can't be saved. And do you just ask them again those clarifying questions? Are you keeping the commandments? Well, no, you can't keep the commandments. You, it means you, get, you try to keep the commandments. 
Well, did he say try or do or do not? There is no try. Uh, he said keep it. He said obey. He says do it or don't do it. There is no try, okay? Um, and this is where I find that, the, ironically, the groups who are saying that they believe these things are the ones that are taking it less seriously than we do as believers in Jesus Christ. Because we, when we, we read Jesus says, be perfect, even as my heavenly Father is perfect, we believe he meant what he said. When he says, keep my commandments, we believe he meant what he said. It's just... We believe that there is a righteousness apart from the law by faith, as Romans 1 makes clear, uh, Apostle Paul, okay? That we are justified by faith, and then we respond in our good works. And in fact, we believe it's impossible unless you have been saved and have the Holy Spirit to be able to do those works and there's another verse, 1 John 4, 18, where he says that if you fear God in his torment, which means everlasting punishment, if you fear that, then you can't love God. And if the first command of God, of Jesus, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that means you can't obey that unless you know that you are forgiven, unless you have no fear of the judgment of God, unless you have peace with God, and there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And so are we required to keep the commands of Jesus? No. But should we be, should we be faithful, obedient followers of Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes. But it's for different reasons. It's coming at it from a different vantage point. In fact, what 1 John says is that you do it because you love God. If you love God, then you will keep his commandments. And by the way, do you know what Jesus' commandments are? Okay, he's not talking about the law. He's talking about his commands. You know what literally the types of things he commanded us to do? He commanded us to love, believe, abide, okay, obey. I, I mean, so he, his commandments are not burdensome, and, and, and they're very few, and they all are about just allowing the Holy Spirit to live this life out through you, not about this system of, of rules that you have to follow in order to keep or to get or to keep your salvation. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, and all Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so this is where you get more of the tactical, okay? And the reason why I say method to, to his madness is because if you, we, if you just stop and think about the context of this, this is 11 men on a hill, in Galilee or Jerusalem, depending on, you know, the context of what we're talking about here. But he said it a few times, like we said. And Jesus says to them, I'm going to go in a few minutes, but you 11 are going to make disciples of all nations. That's your mission. Does anybody have any questions? I imagine that every hand in the, went in the air, like, there's 11 of us. <laughs> Is it going to take like infinitely more people in order to do this, Jesus? I mean, come on. And you can go through church history to see what all those 11 did. Um, and you can, um, you can see, because all, all we know, right, all we know is that somehow you and I, if you believe in Jesus Christ like I do, we somehow believe in Jesus Christ 2,000 or so years after the events, and it's because these guys started the ball rolling. And you have the, the history, the early history in the book of Acts, and then we have some church history, and then it's basically like, you know what? Somehow it happened. Somehow the gospel got to you and to me. But that's crazy, right? I mean, the 11 guys then got the message 
through the entire world to you and to me 2,000 years later. That is absolutely crazy, but there's a reason why Jesus had a tactic. He had a plan, and he says, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. Okay, that's where they were. And so you got like this tiny circle there, and then you got Judea and Samaria. That's the surrounding area. So like wherever your city is, I kind of think of that as your county, right? Okay, and uh, then you have the uttermost parts of the earth. And so it's like jumps out real quick, like your city, your county, and the entire world, guys. Okay, let's just catch it all, right? But you know what? Uh, in the early chapters of Acts, it seems like it took them a really long time to get out of Jerusalem. You know, and some people, they say like, oh, I want to go on a mission trip. I want to go on a mission trip. And you, you just ask them a simple question like, hey, you know, you haven't invited anybody to church. Like, you want to go across the world and you somehow think you're going to preach the gospel all of a sudden? Um, if you want to preach the gospel and you want to be used by God to bring somebody into faith in Jesus Christ and pray today and go out your door and start doing it. Start serving. Start loving on people. Start inviting. Start talking. And I guarantee you, he will use you. He will give you opportunities. What I found is that it's more about uh, whether you want to be used by him, whether you put yourself out there to be used by him, and um, versus the person who's like, I, I, no, please don't ask me. Please don't. I don't want that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know anything. I'm still young in my faith, whatever. They have excuse after excuse and fear after fear. And it keeps them and it paralyzes them from doing these things. Or they say like, well, I don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to lose a friend. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to do that. And I, Jesus said very plainly, you know, some people are going to love you. Some people are going to hate you. But that comes with the territory. And even if they turn around and kill you, they alienate you, they isolate you, they throw you in prison, it doesn't, does it really matter if he's calling you to do it and he's calling you on this adventure and he want, the God of the universe wants to use you for his glory? Does it really matter what other people think or what they do to you? And so there's a method to the madness. And some have said that this is like an outline of the book of Acts, okay? And so you have them slowly going out of Jerusalem into Judea, Judea and Samaria and then into the uttermost parts of the earth, mostly through the Apostle Paul. And so that is that. And so do you feel comfortable praying to and worshiping Jesus? Why or why not? What does it mean to you that Jesus gave you authority to make disciples, baptize, and teach? And what have you done with this authority? How do you understand baptism of the Holy Spirit? And let's have a discussion about this. And what is the difference between evangelism and discipleship? And how can we help you grow in these areas? And how can we do better as a church in these areas? How do you understand water baptism? Are we required to keep the commands of Jesus? And what does this look like? And who is our Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and other most parts of the earth? Personally, and as a church, what can we do to more effectively reach out to them? And so I want to hear from you guys, your comments down below, comments, questions, concerns, accusations of heresy. And I'm going to be checking back to see what you have to say. Like I said, if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, enable notifications, give us a thumbs up on this video, and share it with others. And by the way, you can connect to us on social media as well. And until next time, may his power be with you.